We're in a series called We Are the Church, and so we're looking at us and who God has called us to be. Today I want to talk to you about Jesus is building a victorious church. Jesus is building a victorious church. I heard one amen. Jesus is building a victorious church. Amen. That's good. I love it. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 16, 15 to 18, or 13 to 18, uh, roughly, today. If you want to turn there, I invite you to do that. I remember back to the previous staff, the, the staff that I was on before coming here um, several years ago, and I remember one particular lunch at Olive Garden. I, I will never forget that, that day, that time. I know that uh, I, was, I was having a little bit of a down day. I was feeling a little bit low that day, and I think my body language um, communicated that. And there were, I think, maybe just four or five of us around the table. And I, I, we, were, we were discussing uh, the, the lead pastor's vision and idea of, of going from one kind of service to three different kinds of services back-to-back on the same day, different instrumentation, different music at each service with like a 15 to 30 minute break in between. And I did not realize that we were no longer in the discussion phase. I thought we were in the discussion phase. And so uh, I, I think that my, again, like my body language, my words didn't communicate, yay, let's do it. They communicated, well, how about this other thing? Maybe this other way would be a better way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish here. Well, I was spoken to <laughs> about not following the leader. I'm telling you what, I sat up straight, I leaned in, and I was following from that moment on. And how does that relate to the church? Well, I have a few truths to share uh, today. The first one is this. The victorious church knows who its leader is. The victorious church knows who its leader was. I was acting like I was not knowing who the leader was. I was acting like, I got my own thing I'm doing. What are you all doing, you know? Uh, But in fact, there was a leader who had set a direction, and I had signed up to follow that leader, I needed to do that. (laughs) Uh, One day, Jesus was having a conversation, and it was kind of a serious conversation with his closest disciples. And I don't know about you, but since watching The the Chosen in in groups last season, now I picture everybody differently. I picture Jesus a certain way, Peter a certain way. And one of the things that I discovered is that I often pictured it was Jesus and the 12, Jesus and the 12, but there were many other people in the Bible, the Bible alludes to that, we just doesn't focus on it very much, but there were women that were following, there were other disciples, other men, there, were, there was a large group usually following Jesus wherever he went, but it seems like maybe in this time he had gotten away to just a little bit uh, smaller city, and he was, he was pulling aside a little bit with some of his closer disciples. And Jesus asks a strange question. Who do people say that I am? Well, you would think Jesus, he's the son of God, and so why would he care? But he was asking the disciples, what are you hearing? Who do people say that I am? Well, the disciples said, well, we have heard some stuff. And so they said, some are saying you're John the Baptist. Now, uh, some are saying that you're Jeremiah, a prophet who had been dead for centuries, or Isaiah, or one of the other prophets. And I get the sense that the people around them were just trying to figure out who Jesus is. And they, they could see that he was so powerful that they weren't just simply saying, oh, he must be a new prophet. They were saying, he must be a resurrected prophet like with heavenly powers, because this is not like any other prophet we've ever seen. But Jesus did not want his disciples taking their cues about him from the world. He did not want them relating to Jesus as everyone, the crowd, all the people guessing who Jesus is. That's not where Jesus wanted his disciples to get their their view of him. 
And so he asked the disciples after hearing this discussion, well, some are saying you're this, some are saying you're that. Jesus said, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? So Jesus is saying, guys, gals, you've heard my teaching. You've seen me heal people. You have seen miracles. You've even gotten to know me personally. You know what I like to eat for lunch. Jesus is saying, you've been with me all this time. You've seen so many things. So who do you say I am? And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, he, uh, he, said, who, he asked him, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter spoke up. Not surprising. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one of God, the one who had been promised for centuries to come, although I don't know if everyone was super clear that this was going to be God in the flesh coming, but they knew the Messiah was coming. So Peter says, you are the Messiah, and you're the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. So we know what the humans were guessing, that he's a resurrected prophet. But Peter has this revelation from God Almighty. You're the son of the living God. Wow. The disciples had seen Jesus heal so many people and do so many miracles. But I'm always struck by the story. It's in, in, in Mark 4 where they're out in a boat on a storm. And everyone's panicking, we're going to die, we're going to drown, and everything, we're, uh, we're, uh, it's, gonna, it's going down, it's going down, and Jesus just gets up and says, peace be still. And the storm stops immediately, and what do the disciples say? Who is this? They already know, they've been with him, they've seen his miracles, but when he said, weather, stop, and it stopped, they said, what manner of man is this? What kind of person is this who can say that even the wind and waves obey him? But in this moment, God the Father opened Peter's mind. He gave him a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And we today in the church need a fresh revelation from the Spirit of God of who Jesus really is. Because he is our leader and when you know who your leader is, that affects how you follow. I experienced that myself at Olive Garden. When there's, when there's a little confusion about who's leading, what authority they have, we can sort of follow casually. But when you have a revelation that your leader, the leader of the church, is Jesus, the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God, you sit up. I was kind of leaning back at the table, all like uh, depressed. And, uh, but when I heard, oh no, buddy, you need to be following your leader, I sat up, I leaned in, and said, what do we got to do? And I'm telling you what, from that moment on, I was the leader of making that happen. I was. Like, I took charge. Like, I'm going to make this vision happen because I understood my leader has authority. I'm a man under authority, and I'm not here just to do my own thing. I'm here to follow the leader and get his mission done, and I did, and anyone in the congregation, it was a large congregation, anyone would have said, boy, that, wow, that must have been as much my idea as, as any. Yep, that's right. It's the leader's idea, so it is my idea. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, when you know who the, who the Lord is and who the leader is, that changes how you follow. That is not in my notes, but I've said it twice. I think it might be inspired. When you know who the leader is, it changes how you follow. A.W. Tozer is a great author, and he said, always the most revealing thing about the church is its idea of God. In other words, he's saying it tells a lot about a church when you hear how they relate to God, what their idea of God is. So what about you? Who do you say Jesus is? Do you have sort of a casual relationship with him? Do you say, oh yeah, me and Jesus, we got an understanding? If you're saying that, you do not know Jesus. Okay? <laughs> That's not how Jesus works. 
This is his planet. You're on it because he let you be. You see the difference? When you realize who Jesus is, that affects how you follow. You no longer follow casually. If you're following casually, you probably don't know who Jesus is. So I would just say, get in his word and find out. He's the man who says, weather, stop, and the weather stops. That's big. That's big. That affects how you follow. The victorious church knows who its leader is, and we are following his direction. That's, that's what goes with the victorious church. The victorious church knows who its leader is. It's Jesus. He's the son of the living God, and we are following his direction. May Jesus be our leader at Hope and Life Church. We're part of the big C church, the capital C church, the church around the world. But may Jesus be our Lord, our leader. And that's why we always pray. Because we want to know our leader. We want to know our Lord. We want to know his direction. We want to know his heart. And we want to be following him. We want to be sitting up straight and following Jesus we want to get direction from our leader. We want to be blessed by our leader. We want to hear from our leader. Jesus is building a victorious big C. When I say the big C church, the capital C church, I'm talking about all believers all over the world, past, present, and future, the church, of which Hope and Life Church is a subset. We are a church in the church, the church of the living God. And Jesus is building a victorious capital C church. And Jesus is building a victorious hope and life church. I just declare that. Jesus is building a victorious hope and life church. Long before I came to our church, it used to be called something else before it was hope and life. And long before I came to our church, I have heard a story that's almost reached legendary status. And I remembered it because every day on this day I remember it because it happened at a special business meeting of the church. There was a lot of tension in the room and in the church at the time, uh, so much so that a denominational official had been brought in to lead that meeting. That's, okay, that's sort of an escalation. That's like another, another level, another step. People had taken sides and at one point during this business meeting, it got so heated that someone yelled out, let's take this outside. In other words, to fight with our fists. Oh my goodness. In that moment, the church had forgotten who the enemy is. And they started fighting against each other. And that's my second truth. The victorious church knows who its enemy is. There's only one enemy that we need to be fighting, and it's not each other. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said to Peter and the disciples, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So when Jesus makes a, a statement like this, we don't ever pray, Lord, if it be your will, build your church. He's declared his will. <laughs> So we just say, I'm in it. Let's build this thing, Lord. <laughs> Jesus said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know what is interesting about this passage? This is the first time in the Bible the word church was used. So the first time Jesus brings it up, this called out assembly, this gathering of believers, past, present, and future. The first time Jesus brings it up, he reminds us of a few things. First of all, he reminded us who the church belongs to. Whose church is it? Jesus' church. That's who it belongs to. It does not even belong to me. It does not belong to you. It doesn't belong to the board. The church is Jesus' church. And he reminded us who will build his church. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, Jesus works through people. We do know that. Uh, we are the body of Christ. So we're his, his legs, his feet, his mouthpiece. He works through us. 
but it is him who builds his church. And the first time Jesus ever said the word church, he also reminded us who its enemy is. The gates of hell or the powers of hell, the leaders of hell, the workers of hell, that is the enemy of the church, the devil. That's the enemy. And if we ever get that confused and we start finding someone else within the church, we are wrong. Because the enemy, the devil, that is the enemy of the church, Satan and his forces. And what is he trying to do? He has a mission, just like Jesus has a mission. And Jesus tipped, he tipped us off in, in John 10.10. 10. He said, the devil's mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so many times we think he's, he's out to steal, kill, and destroy Garen. Yes, but he's out to steal, kill, and destroy the church. All believers in Jesus, past, present, and future. That is what he is working against. And if Satan can get Christians to fight each other, he's winning. Because it distracts us from the real spiritual battle, and then he is freer to do his work in other ways. In Ephesians chapter 6, 12, Paul wrote, one of the early church leaders, Paul wrote, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And there's so much in that, that little verse right there. You guys, there is a whole unseen realm, a godly spiritual one, God's family, and there is order, and there are hierarchies, and there is also an unseen evil realm. And there is order, there's chiefs, generals, workers. This is a war, but we just can't see it with our eyes. But it is happening right now, all around us. When the church fights itself, it has been deceived. When the church fights itself, it has been deceived. And it has forgotten who our real enemy is. I get a knot in my stomach when Christians criticize other pastors or churches on social media. Like, I get sick to my stomach. When the church is doing that, don't we have enough mudslinging from those who are outside the church? Does the church really need to say, and that pastor, I don't agree with him. All those pastors need to repent. Really? You're going to say that on social media? Are you kidding me? That is the church fighting the church. That's not our enemy. It happened a month ago at Christmas time because it was the seven year controversy. Christmas Day was on Sunday. And I was so disappointed to see Christians slinging mud while our church is doing it the holy way. And all those other ones, they're, they're not godly. If Jesus can die for us, we ought to be able to do it. Really? That's how the church talks to each other on social media? The church has forgotten who its enemy is. And it's not each other. <laughs> We're on the same team. Oh my goodness. Don't go public on social media and criticize the church. Jesus gave you the plan. If you're offended by another pastor, another brother, another church, What's the plan? Matthew 18. Go privately to that person with a goal of redemption. He's given us the plan. Let's use the plan of our leader. But if you don't know who Jesus is, then you casually follow his plans. Oh my goodness. I'm getting fired up, people. So let's be clear who our enemy is and let's fight him. Let's fight the enemy, the devil and his angels. And conversely, let's support our teammates. Do you know that I am in a process of growing? I have not yet attained perfection, as unlikely as that seems. <laughs> I'm in a process. I'm in a journey. And God, the Holy Spirit, is putting his finger on different areas of my life. But I'm not there in a lot of areas, still making progress. So why don't we just give each other some slack and trust the Holy Spirit is big enough to sort out their business. Amen? The Christians in the other Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching churches in our town are not our competition. 
we are on the same team. Lord Jesus, may you bless Grace Community Church this morning. May you bless Auburn Nazarene this morning, Lord God. May you bless Faith and Victory this morning, Lord God. I pray they have more people saved today than ever before, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would bless Bible Chapel today. Lord, I pray you, you would just pour out your Holy Spirit on all these churches, Lord God. They are on our team. When they win, we win. And when we win, your kingdom wins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are teammates. We are on the same team. We rejoice when they rejoice. And we weep when they weep. Not the opposite. Oh, my goodness. And I, I'm all riled up, but it's not even at you. It's at the, just the thing. The, the whole social media <laughs> whole thing. I, I know we're above that at our church. Oh. <laughs> I mean all of our churches we're, we're above it. The victorious church knows who its enemy is, and we are fighting his deception. If you're taking notes, you notice I very cleverly alliterated. So far, I'm, I'm two for two. Jesus is building a victorious church. Amen? Well, I need to change gears because I'm just so fired up. Last, last summer at youth camp, I did one of the most dangerous things you can do on the planet. It's called slacklining. And it is where they suspend a little teeny strap super high off the ground. And uh, many people do it like they're tied off to it because people do it over canyons, over ravines, or like uh, between a bridge and a rock, like it's, it is so dangerous. And I did it without uh, a, the tie rope. It was amazing. And in fact, I just have a little video to show you of it. <laughs> and I wasn't tied off either. <laughs> I was willing to, to put my life at risk. <laughs> Because I knew I couldn't fail. I mean, if I fell off that, I might get a boo-boo, but I don't think I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. <laughs> I was also willing to do it because I knew I had support. And you see, I tried for a millisecond, a nanosecond to not hold on <laughs> to the shoulders. I could not do it. And the whole time, it's probably it's hard to tell on this little video, but I, I was laughing hysterically the whole time because my feet were out of control. The, the, the strap just vibrated side to side like a guitar string the whole time. It was so funny to me. I just could not even control it. But the reason I was willing to take this great, great risk was because I knew I could not fail. I, I, just, I just can't even stop laughing. It's so bad. So I just want to ask you, what would we as a church try if we knew we could not fail? What would we try to do for God if we knew we couldn't fail? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My final, final truth here, the victorious church knows what its destiny is. The victorious church knows what its destiny is. Jesus said that all the powers of hell would come against the church, so expect it. Expect it. Jesus said it's going to happen. But he said, we will not be overcome. How about an amen to that? Amen. amen. Jesus gave us a mission, and we will accomplish that mission by the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember that some of the times when Jesus got in the boat with the, with the, the disciples, he said, we're going to the other side. And then a storm came up, everyone freaked out, and they said, we're going to drown. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. So their first thought should have been, storm, it appears bad. Jesus is with us. What do you want to do, Lord? Because you said we're going to the other side. Jesus said the gates of hell will not overcome the church. We will not be overcome. And that is our destiny. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached 
throughout the whole world, period, done deal. It is written, it is spoken, let it be done so that all nations will hear the good news and then the end will come. So guess what? The church is going to be successful at global witness. Every nation, tribe, and tongue is going to have a witness somehow of the good news of Jesus Christ. It will happen before the end comes. Praise the Lord. The church is victorious. The church has a destiny. We have a global mission. And today, church, I want you to see that you are part of the Big C Church. That global mission, that promise of success, that leader, that enemy, that's all. We're in that. We're part of it. And Jesus said, after the whole world knows we win in 1 Thessalonians 14, then Jesus will return for the church and we will be with the Lord forever. That's our destiny. Global witness, eternal life with Jesus forever. Wow. I'm in. I'm in for that. I am signed up for that. The victorious church knows what its destiny is, and we are forging ahead with intention. The victorious church knows what its destiny is, and we are forging ahead with with intention because jesus is building a victorious church if you want to be part of the victorious church would you stand to your feet right now we're going to pray and what i'd love to do just something just a little bit different just something uh, similar to what we do at our prayer gatherings wednesday night sunday morning sometimes we'll do this i want to just ask you to use your voice and let's declare that jesus is our lord and he is our leader. You can say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my leader. But let's also say, Jesus, you're our leader, our Lord. Would you just raise your, raise your voices all at once and let's just declare it right now. Who is your leader? Jesus, you are our leader, Lord. I praise you, Lord, that you're my leader. I don't treat you casually. I follow you intentionally. Lord, we as a church, we press in to hear your voice and to follow you, Lord God. You are the Lord of hope and life. You are the leader of hope and life. You are the shepherd. You are the pastor, and I am the under-shepherd. I submit to your authority. We follow you as a people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's also pray that God would reveal any deception that we have fallen prey to. Let's pray for boldness to speak the truth in love. So I'm kind of praying against the enemy and his work right now. Pray that God would, would uh, remove deception from our eyes, from our minds. Give us boldness to speak his truth. Amen. Let's go. Let's do it. Would you lift your voices for just a moment? Lord God, we just lift our voices right now. Lord, we know the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So Lord, we're going to have our ears tuned to heaven. Lord, remove any deception. Reveal it, Lord. God, so that we don't um, get, get soft or lazy or backslidden, Lord God. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that we be on fire, Christians, Lord God, that we, would be, that we would recognize deceit and lies, and that we would speak your truth in love, Lord God. Get, help us not to shrink back. Help us not, Lord God, to be backed into a corner, but help us to be bold and bring your truth in love, Lord God, to the world and to the people around us, Lord God. Lord, we pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And then finally, let's pray that we would fulfill our destiny, that everyone in our community, Southeast Puget Sound region, will find real hope and renewed life in Jesus. And picture some people you know that need real hope and renewed life in Jesus. Pray for them by name, but let's just pray that we as a church would be, uh, we would accomplish the mission God has for us. Okay, would you lift your voice? Lord, right now, Lord, we just pray, Lord God, for the people around us, the community around us, Lord God, that needs you. You said every person's got to know. Lord, help us to do our part that every person would know. Lord, I pray for my next door neighbors. I pray for the family on the other side of them. Lord, I pray for uh, the uh, family of people that I know behind us, Lord God. Lord, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name for uh, the one that's kitty corner to us. I, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would use me, use us as a church, Lord God. Lord, help us to reach all of the people around us, Lord God. Help us to not, uh, not, not let down until every person in our region has heard. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that we would sow your word, that we would sow love, that we would sow kindness, that we would use our words to invite, invite people to church, invite people to your kingdom, invite people to a discussion, invite people to a Bible study, invite people to be prayed for. Lord, I pray that we would accomplish your mission for us on this earth in our region. You've given us a part, a chunk, a region, 
And we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. And one final, one final prayer. I just want to invite you, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you, if you are not sure that you're a part of the kingdom of God, if you're not sure where you are with God, then let's get sure, please, because there will come a final day when there are no more opportunities. Maybe it's not that you've never given you, your, your heart to Jesus, but maybe it's that you have not truly made him your Lord, your leader. Maybe you're taking him casually, trivially, like I'll, I'll obey the stuff I like and the other stuff I'm just not going to worry about. Like that's not how we follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. So would you, every head bowed, if you would, just bow your head, close your eyes, just to, so that it's just no, a distraction-free zone. And online, I encourage you to do the exact same thing. So I don't usually do this, but I just feel like I should say, have you wandered away from the place where Jesus is your Lord? Not just asking, have you ever been saved? I'm asking, is Jesus your Lord? Is he your leader in reality? If your heart's beating really fast right now, it would be a signal, oh, that's me. If that's you, if you're not sure 100% Jesus is your Lord, would you raise your hand? And I want to pray for you. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, or um, it's, it's been a while and you kind of wandered away, if you would like to become a Christian today, would you raise your hand today in this room? And I'll, I'll just lead you in a prayer. Lord, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that every one of us truly would make you Lord. Forgive me, Garen, for the areas of my life where I have treated your leadership casually. I repent. Lord, I want to be in on that global mission. I want to be all in. Lord, I pray that we would all be all in. Lord, for those who are considering following you, putting their faith in you, Lord, I pray that today you would help them turn from their sins, turn their life over to you, and let you lead. Because that's where fulfillment and meaning come from. It's you, the giver of life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Well, if you, are, if you are starting to follow Jesus, I really encourage you to take the Following Jesus course. All right? I think that's going to be a big blessing to you. Thanks, Pastor Darren. We are the victorious church. Amen. Amen. Yes. I love that because it's not that we're like fighting a battle. We're not sure we're going to win. Jesus already won. And so we live victoriously. Amen. It's amazing. Yeah. Amen. Well, um, just a reminder to you, if you, you did fill out those Connect cards, please now. put them in the box yeah. in the back on your way out. And then um, also stick around for the annual business meeting afterwards. You want to talk more about that? Yes. Yeah, so we are going to reset the room to get ready for our meeting. And uh, Pastor Christian will give us some instructions on that. But uh, again, if you are a member of our uh, congregation, that means you've gone through the Can membership class then uh, we are highly encouraging you to stay for our meeting. You will need to sign in at the table out by the fireplace and uh, get your ballots. And only members will get ballots. Yep. Uh, however, if you attend our um, church they're, they're, and haven't yet become a member, it's, it's we still want it's, it's you to come to, to the right meeting on. and just hear where your church has been, where we're going this next year. So that, you're Mary. all invited to stay for lunch and be at the meeting and at the table for everybody there is a financial report and our annual report. I, I so you'll want to pick that up whether you're a member I, I, or not. You, um, um, and what, then what we need to reset the room. Yeah, yeah. so um, when we're resetting the room, the vision is this. Um, we're going to have four tables on this side and five tables on this side with six chairs at each. So that means that there will be yes. Um, yes. a little bit of yeah. space on, e on every table pointing toward the front of the worship center because no one wants to be watching the meeting like this. So we're going to have nine total tables in here with tablecloths, six chairs at each. The best way to do that is to push the chairs to the side, roll the tables in. They're in the bifold doors back there. Set them up. 
put the chairs at the tables, and then we'll figure it out from there. And yeah. I'll be, if you need help with that, I'll be leading the, yeah. the process. And then just one more thing. Lunch will be served in this room. When the curtain opens, that means they're ready for us. How's that? So um, until then, let's just hang tight. And then once that curtain opens, we can eat together. All right? And one more thing. Oh Don't goodness, leave. Don't more. leave. <laughs> if today was your day or if you want to just make a recommitment, today was the day you made a recommitment to following Jesus, please stop by and just grab one of the books at the Following Jesus booth. I don't think I'll be able to be, I'll, I'll try to be there, but if, if you want to talk to me about it, just grab me and I'll talk to you about it. But just grab a book for sure and we'll get you started on following Jesus, okay? All right, All right God ready, bless. Ready, go! <laughs>